Hi, I'm John, and I'm a level one chef. I'm Gabrielle, and I'm a level two chef. I'm Sim. I'm the Dean of Bread Baking at the Institute of Culinary Education, and I've been baking since 1973. I am a huge fan of banana bread. This is a very dumbed-down version of my grandma's recipe. It just makes me feel warm inside. It's one of the only foods that you make when something is about to go bad. I'm making this banana bread gluten-free, but it's gonna taste just as good, if not better. This is a more Caribbean-style banana bread, pan the platanal plantains instead of bananas. First up, we're gonna mash up our bananas. I traditionally like to use very ripe bananas. Toward the end of their life, if you will. They're mushy, they're easy to work with. Their sugar has spiked. <laughs> I don't know how to say that scientifically, but these are sweeter. So we're gonna use plantains. The riper they are, the sweeter the flavor, just like with regular banana bread. Remove the peels off, off our bananas. If they have like little brown spots and stuff, it's okay, that's the point. They're perfect just the way they are. So I'm gonna take the top off and the bottom off, cut this in half, split down the side, and I'm gonna take off my skin. They already smell so good. That's, that's how you know a good, really ripe banana. These are just nice and soft and ready to turn into something beautiful and amazing. Let's roast these plantains. Put a little bit of olive oil on my paper, like that, to lay these out. Put a little bit of sugar, a little bit of butter on top of this, a little bit of rum. It just sort of gives it a nice flavor. Don't go crazy. I'm gonna put these into an oven, 350 degrees, for about 10, 15 minutes. I'm just gonna go up and mash them. Because they're super ripe, I'm just gonna use a whisk. You could even use a fork if you don't have a whisk. But a fork works just great. Here are the plantains. They've now softened up considerably. They're nice and sort of caramelly. And we're gonna put these in a bowl like this, along with a little bit of butter and that sugar and rum. Smells fantastic. Onto the machine now. And we're gonna start this up. And really easy. Mash, mash, mash. This was the best part when I was a kid. I thought it was so fun that my mom let me destroy something in the kitchen. I wanna get these down to like, a banana stew. If there's lumps, that's okay. I like to keep it a little bit chunky, so I'm not gonna totally disintegrate all the banana. They're becoming soft and they're becoming mashed. So I've got my oven preheating and I'm gonna go ahead and grease my loaf pan. Pretty simple, I'm just gonna take a little oil. Simple cooking spray here. And I'm gonna really get that. Spread it around a little bit. Nice and greased. But then I'm going to take my parchment paper. And this really helps you take it out when it's done. We don't want it sticking. So now for our batter. I'm gonna work with the wet ingredients. Have my mashed bananas, which look like baby food. Melted butter. I'm going to start with light brown sugar. sugar. Just gonna mix it all up. I'm gonna add in all my honey as well. They think that the honey creates a little bit more of like a flavor profile rather than just regular sugar. I'm gonna put a little bit of vanilla in here. One egg, gorgeous. Mix this up. Put in my coconut oil, and then I'm gonna put in tahini. It balances out some of the sweetness. Then I'm gonna start whisking this together. Put a little bit of orange juice in here now. Just to moisten up the batter. It's all about the moisture. The moisture, the better. Put the whole orange. Just gonna leave this for a little while, let this get really soft and mushed. Not too many lumps. I actually don't mind a little lumps in my banana bread. But I like it a little chunky. I'm going to go ahead and add in my eggs. Give these a quick whisk before I put in the rest. Instead of using uh, dairy milk, I decided to use an almond milk. And then lastly, we're gonna put in the crown jewel, the bananas. And then it doesn't exactly look pretty, but I wanna try and get this all combined. All my wet is in here. Just like when you make cookies or a cake, you start with your sugar and your butter and your base, and then you go ahead and add in your dry ingredients. It's all fully combined, still have some nice lumps in there. For our dry ingredients, have my flour. Yeah. I wanna sift my gluten-free flour and then almond meal. Sift that in as well to just kind of bulk up this recipe a little bit. I am going to go ahead and just start combining them in little batches so that I can make sure that I'm not leaving anything chunky and it's all combining really nicely. We have salt. salt. Pink Himalayan sea salt, because we're fancy like that. Baking, Baking powder. powder. 
just like with a cake. I'm gonna add my dry ingredients into my wet ingredients. Little by little to not overwhelm it. We're gonna add baking, baking soda, soda. Cinnamon. cinnamon. Just adds a little extra something. Always hold back on cinnamon, just a little bit. And then my vanilla, which I guess is not a dry ingredient, but I forgot it, add it otherwise, so. Sugar, I'm using light brown here. Big fan of nutmeg, which I find is a little bit more aromatic. Also makes you dream. Make sure that all the ingredients get fully combined. I don't want to see bits of flour. I'm sweating. Baking isn't for the faint of heart. Just got some beautiful walnuts here. I'm gonna chop these bed boys up. I have the most important element, the chocolate chunks from actual chocolate bars. I'm gonna see what two of these bars look like and maybe we'll do three. Probably three. Why not? I have these roasted pecans, rough chopped, nice big pieces, and then they go. You don't have to add a nuts if you don't like to, you're allergic, but for me, if I have them, it, it's a must add. Ooh, if you've never had the satisfaction of cutting through a chocolate bar, I highly recommend it. It's very therapeutic and it smells really, really good. We're gonna do a third one. We're gonna put a little bit of ginger in this. Crystallized ginger, chopped quite small. This is to taste. Mix your flour in so that you distribute the baking powder and the baking soda, which is important. Fold the nuts in. This looks so good. I'm gonna give this a stir before I put it into the pan. Here's my mashed. I'm gonna put one egg in. I'm gonna mix that up a little bit more. And all my dry in. You don't want to overmix because the gluten will tighten up. And I'm actually gonna just put a little bit of starter into my mix, just to like liven that flavor up a little bit. This is done. Now I'm going to pour this into my parchment lined pan. You can see the lumps of banana, nice chunks of walnut. All these chunks. You can do this in a metal tin. I sort of like these decorative paper ones. Go ahead and give it a little shake. Okay, this looks good to me. Now to add on a topping. And make it look really pretty. And add some extra flavor. Just gonna add in some simple granulated sugar right on the top of my uh, batter, and this will give it a little bit of crunch. I'm going to cut a banana lengthwise, place it in here. It's a little prettier if you put the seed side facing up. You kind of see the texture of the banana. Put some pecans on. I wouldn't roast these before going on. Just put these on raw. And then I'm gonna go ahead and take my sesame seeds and just do a nice little sprinkling all over the top. I like to put some pineapple on there, just keep that sort of Caribbean theme going. Not too thin slices. They sort of caramelize up a little bit. This is ready to go into the oven now. Just going to preheat my oven to 325 degrees. 350 degrees Fahrenheit. 45 minutes at 350. My banana bread is ready. It's been out of the oven, been cooling for a little bit. It claps a little bit, but that's what happens sometimes. We're gonna turn this stove up, and we're gonna put a little bit of nepage in there. Nepage yep. is actually uh, a glaze that's made from agar agar, which is a seaweed. We're gonna just do a little bit of water in there. Okay, we're melting it down, mixing it in with the water whilst that's going. Let's take these out. With this little spatula guy. Loosen the edges a little bit. Give it a nice little shake here. Oh yeah. Now we're gonna take a little bit of napage here. Glaze my pineapple there. And I'm even gonna do a drip on top of my nuts like that. I tend to put icing sugar on everything, or confection sugar. I just like how it looks. Mmm, <laughs> gorgeous. Ooh, I see the chunks. It's not so wet. It's not gummy, but it's very good to eat. And this is my banana bread. And here is my tahini dark chocolate chunk, gluten-free banana bread. Pan de platano or Caribbean plantain bread. Looks pretty good. Oh mm. God. <laughs> that is good. Mm. Super moist just the way I like it. Nice and sweet, but not too sweet. It's got so many chunks in it. Yeah, I'm so happy it turned out so good. All in all, pretty good result. Mmm, pan de platano. Banana bread is a quick bread that's a popular and delicious way to use overripe bananas. Let's see what each of our three chefs did with their recipes. 
We use bananas as a fruit, but botanically, they're actually a type of berry. Although they're distinctive in taste, bananas share one of the main aromatic compounds you also find in cloves, called eugenol. Eugenol is a colorless compound found in a number of essential oils and often used in perfumery. This smells so good. When unripe, bananas are green with a hard flesh and a very starchy, slightly sour taste. These aren't even gonna be that sweet yet. As bananas ripen, the flesh becomes soft, smooth, and sweet due to amyl acetate and esters that develop. If left to become overripe, the peel gets very dark and the flesh becomes soft and sometimes darkens due to the browning enzyme called polyphenol oxidase. John and Gabrielle used overripe bananas because they're mild, sweet, and soft, and very easy to blend into the batter with a whisk like John did, or a fork like Gabrielle did. This is a great way to use bananas that are at the end of their life. It's really a lovely little life cycle of a banana. Sim used plantains to give his dish a Caribbean flair. It's not banana, but it's not the same. Like bananas, plantains are botanically classified as seedless berries, but are different from bananas in that they retain their starchiness even when they're ripe. So while the plantain's peel may be black, indicating ripeness, they're still very dry and starchy inside with some astringency. Plantains are lower in sugar than bananas and usually aren't eaten raw like their banana cousins due to their high starch content. John's batter was classic, simple, and delicious. He prepared his pan with a cooking spray. It allows the banana bread to release easily from the pan once it's cooled. He used a simple muffin mixing method, which means he mixed all of his dry ingredients, except the sugar, and separately mixed the wet ingredients with the white sugar, and then combined the two with minimal mixing. Simple mix with a fork. He relied on baking powder as his leavener. Baking powder for homemade recipes is really called sodium aluminum sulfate phosphate. It reacts and produces sulfuric acid when it's combined with wet ingredients, and then converts the sulfuric acid to carbon dioxide when it's heated during baking. It's the carbon dioxide that leavens the batter and gives that nice, tender crumb. Gabrielle prepared her pan with parchment paper and brushed it with coconut oil. It's a gluten-free cake, so there's no wheat-based flour. Instead, Gabrielle uses gluten-free flour. If you were to give this to someone and not tell them it was gluten-free, no chance they'd know. Gluten-free flour is a combination of starches that are pulverized to make the consistency of all-purpose flour. It often contains starches from beans, rice, tapioca, potatoes, sorghum, and cellulose. Cellulose is a starch derived from indigestible wood and plant cell walls. Gabrielle also used brown sugar instead of white sugar that John used. White sugar adds straight sweetness, while brown sugar adds more complex, mineral, caramel flavors to Gabrielle's banana bread. She also added tahini, which is made from ground toasted sesame seeds and adds a nutty coffee-like flavor to her banana bread. I think that that's just kind of the element that's bringing everything together. Sim's Caribbean inspired banana bread was started by roasting his plantains with butter, sugar, and rum. This softens and sweetens his plantains, which is necessary for this starchy fruit. Sim also roasted his pecans, which brought out roasted flavors and made them darker due to the Maillard reaction. He used a combination of baking soda and powder to give extra porosity to his final product. This is a heavy and dense batter, so it's good to add both. The orange juice that he added adds a bright citrus note and acts as the necessary acid along with molasses on the brown sugar and the starter culture. This starter culture is not needed here since there's enough acid from the orange juice and the brown sugar to make the baking soda react. This isn't really important, but it does make a nice addition. Sim added it because it gave a tangy quality to his banana bread. John added chopped walnuts for texture and a richness that comes from this high fat nut. Something about the nuts and the banana bread just, just go really hand in hand. Gabrielle added semi-sweet chocolate that she chipped from bars. 
These misshapen shards of chocolate melt beautifully in layers. The chocolate and the tahini are delicious together and create a unique, and sumptuous flavor in her banana bread. The tahini is so subtle, if you didn't know, you wouldn't think it was in there. Sim added candied ginger, giving his banana bread a warm, spicy sweetness. It also adds a bit of crunch because the sugar is crystallized. John keeps it classic with a dusting of granulated sugar on top. The temperature of the bread never gets hot enough to fully melt the crystalline sugar, so it retains its crunchy structure. The sugary topping on top, oh my God, it's so good. Gabrielle sliced a banana in half lengthwise and placed it gently on top of her batter with white sesame seeds sprinkled on top. It doesn't have to be super ripe. You can use a normal banana for this. This gives a hint as to what's in the banana bread. Sim added sliced pineapple to one loaf, keeping with his Caribbean theme, and pecans to the other loaf. He brushed his garnish with Nepage. Tastes pretty good. Which gives a classic shine and added sweetness, and finished it with a very light dusting of powdered sugar. John baked his banana bread for an hour at 325 degrees in a traditional nine by five loaf pan. This ensures that the center of his dense batter bakes without burning the outside. Gabrielle baked her banana bread for 45 minutes at 350 degrees in a traditional nine by five loaf pan. She had extra rich ingredients in her bread like tahini, honey, almond meal, and almond milk, so she needed the higher temperature to dehydrate her batter. Sim baked his in smaller pans for 35 to 40 minutes at 350 degrees. Plantains are lower in water and higher in starch compared to bananas, so they don't require as long of a cooking time to dry the bread. It's not quite as wet as your regular banana bread. Banana bread is a treat from start to finish. Next time you have bananas that will be better off in a batter, I hope you'll consider some of our three chef's ideas to make it your own. Hey, Gabrielle. Oh, mind, uh... Anthony! Yeah. Come hey on in. I would Can love I? for you to try this. Yes. I would love to try it. Please do. <laughs> huh? Oh, it's really good. Uh huh. Well, I have a little secret for you. What's that? It is gluten free. We're not going to air this, right? <laughs> Fine. I'll just Mr. finish this. Mr. Non-Gluten-Free himself. This will be our secret. I have a, an image to maintain of being anti-gluten-free stuff. This is good.